morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we can be here together. We welcome our folks on uh, Facebook with us. We're glad that you're with us. We've been uh, recording this each time, but this time we're here live. And uh, we pray that this will be a blessing. You were able to come. I appreciate the effort that's been put forth. Uh, how we need to uh, let God work in us and do what He wants to do. I want to pray with us to begin with, and you pray and ask God to work and to use this message and to use this time of worship to speak to us. We're here today. And also those who are watching by Facebook and, and YouTube. So let's pray together. Our Father, there's a lot of fear going around today. But we find in the Word of God that you give us faith that we can trust you. So we're here today in obedience to your Word, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some days. And you tell us to do that all the more as we see the day of the coming of the Lord approaching. And Lord, we believe that so many things have been fulfilled that Jesus could come in a moment. And we thank you for that promise. But we pray this morning that you'd be glorified. That your people would be edified. The church would be edified. And that your will could be done in this time together. You said your word would not return to you void. Father, we believe that. Uh, we trust in that. And so we pray that you do a work in us through and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we want you to get the glory. Speak to us. May we be open, receptive. And we'll thank you for what you do. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, wherever you are here this morning, you may put it up online, on your telephone, on an iPad. But I want you to turn with me in the book of Genesis, in chapter 5. I'm going to read there in just a few moments, verses 21 through 24. Chapter 5, Genesis, 21 through 24. But the reason I'm there is because of the scripture in the book of Hebrews. So just... Put you something there to mark it, hold your finger in that place, and turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, which is the faith chapter. And I guess we could just entitle this this morning, Faith or Fear? What would we do? Would we believe God? Or would we believe the opposing uh, powers that oppose God's work? And we find in chapter 11, we call it the faith chapter. We find so many accounts and testimonies of people who are listed in God's Word because of their faith. And we're going through the book of Hebrews, so this, this morning takes us to Hebrews, from Hebrews to Genesis chapter 5, so you keep those places. And I'm going to read first in chapter 11, the book of Hebrews, beginning with verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's a very important phrase, that he pleased God. And then in verse 6, it uh, elaborates on that thought of pleasing God by saying, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, faith is a peculiar term in the fact that it's something you can't see, you can't grasp, but it's there. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've had people say, Pastor, uh, I need more faith. How do I find that? And my answer is simply open the word of God. Uh, get your mind in it and let God speak to you through it. But the 
description of faith is in verses 1 and 2 in this same chapter. So we can describe faith to you as well as where you found it. For it says in verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is, uh, it is the kind of substance that we're hoping for, that we're planning on, that we have our confidence in, and that we have evidence in, evidence of, even though we cannot see it. Now, when you think about having evidence of something we cannot see and having substance of things that we just hope for, we need to understand that Webster gives this definition. Now, I said verse 1 was a description. Uh, Webster gives us a definition. It is unquestioned faith that does not require proof or evidence. Now, that's good, but... I want you to think about it this way. We who are the people of God, we who are saved, go farther than uh, Mr. Webster in the dictionary because we have proof and evidence for us who are Christians in the Word of God. So being without proof or evidence is for those who read it physically, carnally. But for we who are Christians, we have that Evidence we have that substance because we have and we read the Word of God and we believe that and we do it by faith. Now, in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 11, uh, you can go through chapter 11 and you can find written the names of people who have trusted God by faith. And it wasn't a time that they did not have the Word like we had it. And they trusted God by what they had been taught by the prophets, uh, what they had looked to and trusted in, looking to the future. And they trusted in that. They did not have proof or evidence, but they believed. And that is the essence of faith. Now, I want us to go back to the book of Genesis where we find the illustration of what Paul has said to the Hebrews. By the way, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. So we have an illustration in chapter 5 of the book of Genesis. The Bible says in verse 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. So Enoch was sixty-five years old, when their child, he and his wife, their child came along, they named him Methuselah. And it says from that point on, Enoch walked with God, and he walked with God 300 years. And he did that by faith. That's why it's mentioned in the book of Hebrews in the faith chapter. And then in verse 23, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years. He was 65 years old when Methuselah was born. He began walking with God and walked with God 300 more years. And then verse 24 tells us the outcome. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So you keep in mind this morning that as we read in this book of Genesis chapter 5, that eight times it mentions a person's name and after that it says, and he died. Eight times, and he died. But we come to Enoch, and the scripture does not say he died. It says, and he walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. It's the only bright spot in the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis. The only spot that we can read uh, and realize that there is an element in faith that we need to understand from the word of God. It's an oasis in the midst of a spiritual desert of people dying. But we are understanding today that because of Jesus Christ that we can be alive and we are alive today physically as I speak to you as we listen to God's word. But we also are alive spiritually simply because God has changed our life and because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because the Bible says that because of that sin that the wages of sin is death. So somebody had to die. That's why you and I have the sentence upon us that we have to die. 
But we understand that Jesus came and he went to the cross and he took your sins and my sins upon himself and he died there for us and therefore giving us eternal life. So even though the body dies, the soul and spirit of we who are Christians will go to be with the Lord and be with him forever and for eternity. And keep in mind that all of that is done in faith. I can't hold it. I can't handle it. I can't see it. But I can read the word of God and that is our proof and our evidence and that is the basis of our faith. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, the difference here in verse 24 is that God took him. And the reason God took him was because he walked with God, the Bible says. As a matter of fact, his name means consecrated. So Ian was consecrated and he walked with God. Ian is a unique person in a couple of ways. He's but one of two that the Bible says walked with God. The scripture in Genesis chapter 6 says that Noah walked with God. And in chapter 5, it says that Enoch walked with God. Those are the only two in the Bible that that terminology is used for, that they walked with God. And so as we go on to see the second thing about Enoch that is unique, he is one of two who went to heaven without dying. One of two who went to heaven without going through the portals of death. Now, I understand the Bible says that uh, it's once appointed man to die, but after this the judgment. And so between here and there, they were translated. The Bible uses that word in the book of Genesis. They were changed because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They had to be changed to go into that particular realm to be with God. And so they were changed between here and there. I don't know about that. I can't tell you about that. But I know the Bible says that. And so one of two that went to heaven about that. Now this is a very important point that I will make. When I read the scripture and said that he pleased God, Enoch is one of only two that the Bible says pleased God. Use that actual terminology. Now we know that one was his son, our Savior Jesus. He pleased God. It talks about that, uh, uh, talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, talks about what uh, uh, God did for us through Jesus, and it says that Jesus pleased God. But it also says here that Enoch pleased God. Well, why did he please God? What do we do today in order to please God? If it's so important, only mentioned twice, and we need to take note of this, what is important about it? It is so important about it simply because we walk by faith. That's how he walked. You and I are walking by faith today. And as we walk by faith today, we need to improve our walk. I don't think there's any of us, uh, myself especially, I know more about me than I do about you. I don't think our, there are any of us can say that we walk closest with God as we need to. And so here we can find four simple lessons that tell us some things about walking with God. Let's look at those four things this morning. Number one, we see the commencement of Enoch's walk. How he began walking with God. Verses 21 to 22. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Up to 65 years, Enoch didn't walk with God. He lived in a wicked generation. If you don't believe that, uh, you can look in chapter 6 and you can find the Bible says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is flesh. The days of his, uh, his days shall be 120 years. Uh, cutting down things. Uh, uh, the length of life. Uh, the length of life has been cut down because of sin. Because we've gotten away from God. Uh, and the Bible teaches us that the sons and daughters of uh, God saw the sons and daughters of men in verse 2 that they were fair and they took their wives of all they chose. And we find in verse 5 that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination and thoughts of his heart were only evil continuously. So we find that Enoch walked for 65 years in the wicked world and as far as I can tell was a part of that. But in 65 something happened. They had a child. 
And so uh, the commencement of his, walk is, of his walk is marked by the son that was born to him. God's gift to him, God's gift to his family was the meaning of the, the, the way that God used to bring him to himself. Uh, it's interesting today that everything he gives to us, there comes with, a, with it a responsibility. And we find today that the responsibility came to Methuselah, to uh, Enoch when he had his son Methuselah, that he realized how much he needed God. And that has happened to us sometimes. Sometimes children born to us awake our responsibilities. Sometimes the things that we come in contact with awake us to our responsibilities. But something got your attention. Something got my attention. Something got Enoch's attention. It was his son. What was it in your life that caused you to see how much you needed God? And he had turned to God at 65. And then the scripture says, not only did his son influence, influence him, but his revelation, the revelation that God gave him influenced him. What revelation? I want you to look at the name Methuselah. Have you ever looked it up? Have you ever stopped to realize what that son's name meant? Methuselah It's a tongue twister uh, when you say it sometimes. But the name means this. When he, he is dead, it shall be sent. That's the meaning of the name. When he is dead, it shall be sent. When who is dead? When Methuselah dies, it shall be sent. 900, the Bible says that he lived 969 years. 969 years after this happened, he died. And when he did, the flood came. So when he dies, what shall be sent? The flood. And at that time, Enoch realized there was a judgment. There was a time that God would require uh, his life of him. A time that God would call him before him in judgment. The flood represents the judgment of God upon this earth and upon the people that disregarded God. And so we find here that God's uh, influence influenced him as well as his son influenced him. Uh, the world would last no longer. And so there was an urgency. Ladies and gentlemen, there's an urgency this morning upon us to live for God because Jesus is coming back. It is a picture. It is a type of the second coming of Christ. Jesus is coming back and we give an account unto him. The commencement of his walk is the first thing we need to understand. Why and how and what God's doing in our walk. The second thing I want us to see is the character of his walk. Now there's not a lot stated, stated in these few verses in the book of Genesis chapter 5. But the implications are many. Let me give you three implications that indicate the character of his walk. Number one, his walk implies a saving faith. He was a sinner like all of us. He was reconciled with God. How do I know? Because the Bible says in 11, 5 of Hebrews, Enoch had a testimony that pleased God. And the next verse it says, without faith it's impossible to please him. We see there is an implication of a saving faith that his life was changed. If for you and I to walk with God, there must be a saving faith. There must be something that happens in us. The Bible says you must be born again. We're born physically to get in this world. We're born spiritually to get in the next world and to be with God. His walk implies a saving faith. If you're walking with God, it is an indication that he has saved you. He's changed your life. And now you can have fellowship with him and you can walk with him. His walk also implies spiritual communion. And Enoch walked with God. That spiritual communion. Luke 22 and 61 tells us that Peter followed a far off. He lost his communion. He lost his fellowship with God. But yet we find in Amos chapter 3, it says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? We must be agreed. Enoch and God were uh, agreed. Enoch walked with God. Enoch pleased God. And it was a spiritual communion. I want to emphasize today that this is a personal relationship we have with the Lord Jesus. And that personal relationship requires a walk and a fellowship and a communion that we are in the Word and we have prayer. We talk with Him. He talks with us and we walk with Him. It implies a spiritual communion. 
But not only does it imply saving faith and a spiritual communion, thirdly, it implies a surrendered will. He walked 300 years. How many people do you know, especially in the flesh, would you walk with anybody for 300 years? Uh, it's hard enough today sometimes for two people to walk in this world together because they can't be agreed. But here is Enoch walking with God 300 years. He walked with him, the scripture says. Uh, we're generally in this world non-committal. But when God changes our life, it changes our commitment as well. And he had a surrendered will. He surrendered himself to God. He did not go with God a day or two. He did not go with God a month or two or even a year or two. He went with God 300 years. A surrendered will. He did not run. He did not jump. He did not spurt. He walked steadily. The Bible tells us we need to walk with God and not leave his company. We won't be here 300 years, but as long as I'm here, I will walk with God. Amen? It's good for us to walk with him. So we're seeing now the commencement of his walk. We've talked about the character of his walk. Now, I want us to talk for just a few minutes about the consequences of his walk. What could happen in a 300-year walk? <laughs> uh, it, it would take a scribe. It would take someone, uh, a recorder, uh, every day to record something that's going on to walk. I can't imagine what all could happen in 300 year walk. But I'm going to tell you there are three things I think are very important. Number one in verse 22 if you read there Enoch walked with God and he begat after he begat the foods of 300 years he begat sons and daughters. There was spiritual growth in his life because of his walk. It implies progress. You can't remain the same if you walk with somebody for two or three years or even sometimes for a month. But think about 300 years and what happened to him, spiritual growth. Henry Varney said these words, the world is yet to see what God can do with, for, and through a person who is fully and wholly surrendered unto him. We cannot understand all that God did with Enoch as they walked together 300 years. I can look back in my life. I'm sure you can look back in your life and you can see the things that God has done for you and how the change in your life has been pleasing to the Lord. My prayer is you can see that and we need to understand spiritual growth. It is not the, the, the ultimate. It is not the end when we become a Christian. Being saved is not all it's about. It is walking with God. It is spiritual growth. It's becoming more like Him. We are to be like Jesus. Christian, the word implies being like Jesus. He walked and he got spiritual growth. The second thing he had was joy and peace. There's joy when you walk with God. As a matter of fact, I read about David in the Bible and all the Scriptures that, uh, like the first 76 uh, chapters we call them of the book of Psalms, all of those are uh, authored by David. And the scripture says in verse, chapter 23 rather, uh, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why did David say that? It's because he walked with God. Now, I've got to stop here for just a minute and, and say something that I don't want you to take wrong. But I want you to understand something. We say we're people of faith, but we don't live like we're people of faith. Now, I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to be foolish. I don't want to do something that is not pleasing to God. But I think about Paul, who was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. I think of Stephen, who was stoned to death. And I can turn over here in the book of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And let me just do that for just a minute. Uh, it talks about the people who live by faith. It says here, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging. Moreover, of uh, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in desert and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Does that paint a picture for you what the people who live by faith in the time that Paul's talking about and you and I are scared to go to church? 
because we're afraid we'll catch the virus. Now, I know that doesn't sit well. But I'm going to tell you this. I think we ought to take precautions, but I think we ought to do what God says. We ought not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as the matter of some is, and all the more as we see today approaching. My wife and I have not missed a Sunday going to church. I have not missed a Sunday even more than once in the week preaching. I have had funerals. I have tried to be careful, and I'm going to continue to do that. But folks, if I believe God is God, and I believe he saved me, I believe he can keep me. Amen? Amen. That was a little bit weak. <laughs> but amen. amen. Now, let, let me read scripture to you. And we say we believe the word of God. And, and I, I understand, that. folks, we're going to get sick in this life. There are sicknesses that will overtake us. But be careful to understand that God says in Psalm 91, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And then in verse 10, There shall be no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all my ways. Verse 15. He shall call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Do we believe God can take care of us or what? Amen. Amen. Now, I know this doesn't sound well. I don't you say, well, I, I'm afraid I'm going to die. Well, Paul would. We are going to die. Paul said for me to live is Christ and for die is gain. And, and, and I'm not in a hurry to die. But folks, I'm not going to stop doing what God wants me to do because I'm afraid of the virus. We need to man up, woman up, and not be wimps. We need to be careful. We take care of ourselves. But we need to understand that God will work in our lives if we allow him to do that. And he promises never to say us and never to leave us. And I'll hold my hand up. I believe that. And I'm going to try to trust him. You may find me in the hospital sick, but you can tell him this. He's there in the will of God, for nothing comes upon us except it's not God's will if we will walk with him. So we had spiritual growth. We had joy and peace. And then thirdly, he had a witness. He was a witness. It says that Enoch prophesied, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. That's in Jude verses 14 and 15. The only place that's in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere else. Enoch prophesied, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. He was taken out before the flood. The church will be taken out before the tribulation. It's a picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's a picture of what's going to happen in this world one day. It is the consequence of our walk. We're walking with God. Now there's one more thing, and then we'll be through. Not only the commencement of his walk, the character of his walk, the consequences of his walk. Fourthly, lastly, the climax of his walk. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So the, the climax of his walk is very simple. He was translated. Translated, that word is a Latin word. It is an irregular verb. It means to be carried across. He was carried across death to be with God. And he was translated. Faith became sight to him. His hope became a, re became a reality. The result of his 300 year with walk and, uh, walking with God and what God did with him when the Thusa was born, he finally achieved that, the climax of his walk. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming back. You're going to die. I'm going to die. But I'm going to be with Jesus. And you're going to be with Jesus as well. And we need to live like it and let God work through us and be in us and glorify himself. Not only was he translated, but he was a type. He is a type of the believers who will be alive when Jesus comes back. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Well, we shall not all sleep. We shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he's coming back. And we'll be changed. And that's the climax of the walk that we have with the Lord Jesus today. I think about the little girl. You've heard this story, I think. Probably many times. The little girl who went to Sunday school and they studied about Enoch. 
She came home and she did her best to tell her mama what they had learned today uh, in Sunday school. And the mother said, well, honey, what, what did you find out? He said, well, God came by every day the garden where he had lived. And he went walking with God. He had walked with God. And he did that every day for many years. And one day they walked and they went so far and he had said, God, it's time for me to go back home. It's getting late in the day. It's going to push me to get back. And God said to him, well, you're closer to my home than you are to yours. Just come and go home with me. That's what's going to happen. We'll go home with him one day. God's in charge. God's in control. I'm going to let him be God. How about you? Pray with me. Father, thank you. We have the privilege this morning of opening your word. We have the privilege this morning of being a Christian. And Father, I pray you protect us, you watch over us, you care for us. And Lord, even in sickness, if that's your will, you promise to work all things together for good if we love you, if we're called according to your purpose. We believe your promises. We pray, God, that your will could be done in our lives and in our hearts. Use us this day, use us this week to bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. To you out there this morning on Facebook or watching, if you're not a Christian, you can bow your heads right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. He died for you. Take him by faith. And he'll save you. And he'll change your life. May God bless you this morning and this week. Let's say this together. Here I am.